joining us. Oh, we are getting started and I see more and more people joining us live right now. All right. And Marjorie, I see your question. If this is not too far off today's focus, I'm curious about how associations are going about investing in IT security to prevent breaches and whether this is evolving. Interesting stuff. We're going to start off with sort of a, um, a story about what's going on with higher logic, and then we're going to move into um, more about uh, tech investments in general. And that's probably something we can, we can open up and talk about uh, then. So, all right. And, and Marjorie, if you can hear me, if anyone else can hear me, I want to make sure do a little audio check before we get, get started officially. Okay. So if you can hear me, okay, let me know. Excellent. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. And, uh, I just want to let you know that as we get started, um, there are a couple ways that you can engage. Obviously you have, have the chat box over here on the side. Uh, but then if you are listening live, you can also add your questions and topics uh, underneath the screen, the large screen, you'll see that you have questions and topics um, that you can you know, add your questions there. But I'll certainly be looking over in the chat box along the way. So don't worry about that. All right. We're going to get started right now. Welcome to this edition of Association Chat, your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming trailblazers and thought leaders alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm your host, Kiki Latalian, CEO of Amplified Growth Digital Marketing and host of this weekly chat that's been around since 2009 on different platforms and now on Crowdcast. For this week's show, I have a story to tell you. In late September 2016, the cloud-based community platform provider Higher Logic closed on a $55 million investment from JMI Equity, which is a growth equity firm. Many of us in the association industry were fascinated to find out what the investment means for Higher Logic's devoted users and the association community as a whole. And the bigger question of what the investments mean for the association industry and the tech companies that associations work with. So there's a lot to unpack there, I know. So I wanted to get started with a positive example of a hardworking tech company with a big success story to tell. So today's first guest is Higher Logic CEO, Rob Wenger, whom I've invited here to talk about the path to this investment, Higher Logic's plans for growth, and uh, and to talk a little bit more, let me get him up here. Yay! Thank I you. see you. I see you. Yes, hey. Technology is working. Um, yes, the technology is working. I think um, the plan, Higher Logic's plans for growth, and any challenges or discoveries that Higher Logic has made since going through this process. So welcome, Rob. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for having me on the show. I, I I love the show and love what you're doing for the community. It's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let me just make sure that everybody here has audio. I think we lost it for a second. Audio, audio, audio. The live streaming. Thank you, Meredith. All right. So let's get started with why JMI and why now? Like, you know, you guys have been very successful, wildly successful, some would argue, for a while. And so you have to have had other offers. Why JMI? Uh, good question. So as to why GMI, yeah, we did have other offers. We had um, over the years a lot of inbound interest in Higher Logic, uh, mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, from companies wanting to acquire us and make them part of their solution. And we just were never into that. That wasn't really our goal or our plans. Um, uh, uh, GMI though is a an investor, right? So they just invest in companies that are doing well, uh, growth companies, and so we did that with them to you know sort of give us um, a leg up on the kind of growth that we want to have going forward. So we just recently reached our 100th employee, um, which, is a, which is a fairly big milestone, and started looking at the five-year plan and thought, you know, we could really use some help, um, not just financial help, which obviously they provided, but 
uh, as well as that guidance in um, a lot of different areas uh, in how to grow to be five, 10 times our size, in how to um, uh, add products on as tack ons, like, like acquisitions and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, they're obviously experts in that. And so it was really as much for the guidance as the money. And I think JM JMI's bit of it was the guidance was, was sort of what we saw best from them versus the others. They all have money. Um, but 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 sort of their track record and, and their ability to help us grow is what we liked about them the most. Yeah, you guys, I mean, so so uh, <clears throat> Higher Logic has this devoted community, truly. Um, it, it's you just had a very pot, you know, uh, another fantastic conference where users conference where people come in and um, from my, what I've heard, from my understanding, I've been to a few of them, but way back in the day, they keep growing and yeah. people are really, um, I don't know. I mean, from from the sounds of what you know I've been seeing online and from close friends of mine, um, it's just really growing in such a positive way. I know that a concern for Higher Logic was to make sure that, that all your current users um, you know, and all all the all the customers who, you know, believe in you have been with you for so long that you wanted to let them know that, you know, it's not like uh, this is a negative thing in any sort of way or is going to negatively impact them. So, can you tell me a little bit more about that and maybe, you know, what you you know how you went into planning to address this, you know, proactively before, you know, before it all happened? Sure. So, um, one of the great things about JMI and this investment is that they've been looking in the association space for a long time. Um, there is a lot of activity recently, <clears throat> you know, with Abila and Personify and, and, and uh, uh, your membership and some of these other guys that have, that have done private equity deals in the last few years. Um, the association world has gotten a lot of, of, of publicity from that. Um, and so uh, JMI and some of those we talked to were interested as much in the fact that we're a growing company is as they were in the fact that we are, you know, in the association space and have a lot of great, happy clients and so forth. And so um, one of the things I want to make sure that everybody understood is that this is by no means uh, uh, sort of a, an off ramp, right? This is, mm -hmm. this is business as usual growing and continuing to grow. And even just the pace we've been growing, which this year um, was uh, probably 80% so far, you know, that's, that's difficult to keep up. Um, mm -hmm. And so the money and guidance helps us do that. So it's not like. I lost audio. Lose audio. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. Audio's back. Uh oh. All right, Rob. <laughs> you know, this is the worst part of doing live streaming, guys. Um, man, oh, he's gonna re he's going to reconnect. Can you, you hear me? There? Yes, mm -hmm. I can hear right. you. Yes, Good. great. Um, okay, so I think my little headset thingy is dead. All right. Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, so what was I saying? Um, yeah, so so concentration on associations. Uh, is one of the things I want to make sure that our association clients heard that message. Um, mm -hmm. There was some chatter around when it first happened that we were going to, you know, go into the commercial space, you know, jump in with both feet. And that's not the case. I mean, we are certainly going to be selling into that space as we have been for a few years, but associations is still by far our primary market. It will be uh, for at least the next five years. So our five-year plan has us, concentrated in the association space. So that's not going to change. Um, and yeah, and I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. The other thing is nothing is changing here in higher logic. This was not a majority investment. JMI is not coming and taking control, as was the case in some of those other deals. Um, we are still, the higher logic team is still running the company and uh, still, you know, owns all the, uh, the rights to do that. So that's not changing. And those were kind of the two messages plus sort of the upside message of uh, you know, the growth and being able to tack on some other products, hopefully to get things to market more quickly. Well, you know, and I'm so, so glad, glad to hear that, that too, too. Because, because, you know, yeah. there is, hang on a second, there's just a little bit of a backup. Okay, background noise. Um, 
I was so glad to hear that too, because, you know, when you visit the higher logic offices, I had a chance to do this recently when we did an association chat live from there. Um, you know, they have hoverboards, they have like, they, <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. It's a great culture. And so I know that that's another piece of it is you want to make sure that, that you maintain that culture and that sort of fun, loving, creative attitude. Exactly. Yeah, no doubt. It's, uh, and that comes from even the industry we're in. I mean, it's just a fun industry to be in. We're, yeah. we're, we're friends as much as we are vendors and partners to our clients. And so, yeah, we want to keep. So let me ask you this. So what is, um, what is, can you give us a peek behind the curtain or give us a clue of some of the cool things that you guys are cooking up or maybe what's first on your, on your list of, of developments that you're, you're looking at. Can you share any of that with me? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of uh, roadmap items had on the roadmap for a long time, right? Um, the big one this year is really around data, big data. So integrating with uh, systems like Power BI and Tableau, creating data warehouses, uh, sending our customers' data to their own data warehouses or their backend systems, their marketing systems, their AMSs, et cetera. Um, that's one of the big things that we're getting into in terms of a roadmap. But in terms of specifically of the JMI deal, um, what it allows us to do is two major things. One, in terms of product. One is to um, expand our product team so grow it significantly over the next year or two, and that will allow us to get more product out uh, more quickly and uh, so more of a breadth of product. So we're excited about that. The other thing is acquisitions. So there are other sort of niche players in the association market with products that, or maybe not in the association market, products that would benefit the market. Um, and where they are you know, helpful to remember engagement, which is really our thing, um, where integrating them with the data we have and with the data in the AMSs and CRMs would be helpful. That's the kind of thing we want to do. So something, you know, completely off the side uh, has nothing to do with the member facing stuff. That's not our area. But if it's member facing and engaging with the members, it helps engaging in it and it provides data. That's that's kind of where we want. Mm. So um, I want to ask you, uh, what has been the reaction from the market, from customers, from partners that you work with who are like, oh, what's going on now? And how does this impact our relationship? Yeah, I mean, so far, everybody seems very, very happy. Now, I have some bias that they sort of tell me what I want to hear or think I want to hear, which is not necessarily what I want to hear. But uh, but yeah, I mean, everybody's been great about it. Um, we had, you know, in doing the... Um, sort of the diligence portion of the deal, uh, JMI called 25 of our clients. So there were a bunch of people who knew about it in the industry before it happened, and they were all very excited. And, you know, we got feedback from them in that regard. Um, they called several of our partners and, and the same sort of thing. So it was, um, yeah, it went as well as a deal like this possibly can go, I think. I mean, everybody was happy in the beginning. Everybody's happy at the end. Um, you know, we've spent the last, was it been six, seven weeks uh, since the deal? working uh, a lot with our clients and partners, but also with JMI, and everything's been fantastic. You mentioned our user group meeting uh, from last week. It was our biggest ever, something like 450 people, um, and it was incredibly upbeat. It always is, but I think it was even more so this week. Uh, and uh, no, I mean, just everyone seems very excited. So, and, and I've also had other CEOs of other industry um, uh, vendor companies call excited about it as well. I think it, it, it brings more light to the market. Um, yeah, JMI is a, is a very well-respected organization, an investor. And, um, you know, of course, we have a, a good reputation in the market. So to see us come together, I think, from both sides has been very positive for really everybody. So uh, I'm excited. So, okay. So um, when you look at... And I just want to make sure that there aren't any questions over here really fast that I'm missing. Okay, no. Um, you know, when you look at maybe, um, I don't know, we were talking a little bit about the future. Let's talk a little bit about what you're going through right now. Um, is it, what are you learning about going through this process and growing? And I'm sure there are things that you've discovered along the way. Yeah, what's interesting, I think that probably the, the biggest thing help that we've had from them since doing the, the deal is <clears throat> their realization and conveying to us that we probably in order to 
sort of prepare for the growth that we're already seeing, we, we are adding more of a, a sort of a management layer to the company. Um, everyone at higher logic has always been a doer. You know, I, until probably a few weeks ago was occasionally coding on the product and doing things like that, which, you know, uh, will probably change, unfortunately. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, adding that sort of, uh, layers that will allow for the growth that we anticipate. So at a hundred staff, and 12 departments, you know, we can do so much. But if, as we start, you know, expanding those departments significantly, as we start expanding geographically, uh, initially in the United States, um, and then later in uh, Europe, at least, um, you know, we need sort of professional management mm. in the company. And so that's kind of an area where they, they pointed out that, you know, to get to level, whatever, we're on level four, to get to level five, six, and seven, we need uh, to start putting those things in place. And so it's a lot of those kind of things, systems, you know, better systems internally um, for running the business, uh, things like that. And then processes around all of this. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the main thing. I mean, th nothing else in terms of where we were, um, you know, the diligence process, they have people come through and pick through every little detail. And at the end they said, you know, for a company your size, you're doing awesome. Uh, so we were, we were very happy about that. Um, and then at the same time they say, but to be five times your size, 10 times your size, here's what you need to do. And, and, and that's what has been occupying kind of the last uh, six weeks of our time, hiring key hires, key executives. We got a CFO uh, since then already uh, very quickly. We have another C, couple of C-level folks that we're going to be uh, putting in place in the next few months to really, you know, get ready. Wow. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's incredible to hear this story because I think that um... – you know, I mean, I've, I've known you guys for years and I, I think that, you know, watching uh, the company grow and how much care that you've all put into it and really the care and feeding of making sure that it's a high quality product, that you have a good culture and people enjoy working there. Um, that, you know, I was, I was wondering how you scale that beyond what you've done, because, I mean, can you speak to, a little bit to your going back into history and talking about, you know, like how fast have you grown actually? Like how long did it take you to get to this point? <laughs> yeah, so we'll be celebrating our uh, in a few weeks. So it's, so it's probably longer than you would think. Uh, nine years is a fair amount of time. But yeah, we have grown pretty quickly. I mean, nine years ago, uh, December 2007, it was me, just wow. me. And, uh, wow. and you know, we, we added folks. Sitting uh, alone in your office. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not quite my garage, it's a little cold. <laughs> In my, in my office in my house, uh, coding away. And uh, yeah, nine years later, as I mentioned, we're 100 people. And so, you know, I think uh, it's not ridiculously fast growth, but considering that we did that without investment uh, prior to this, um, considering that we, and we did that on purpose. It wasn't that, you know, we weren't offered the money. It was more that we wanted that thoughtful growth. We wanted to be able to really... Um, focus on the product and focus on the people and less so just on numbers. Um, and I don't expect that to change actually. Um, you know, the, the, the conventional wisdom is that the, 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 the private equity guys are just numbers guys and that's all they care about. And that's not the case at all, actually, at least so far it's all been about, you know, this sort of growing of the company without necessarily focusing on where you're going to hit these numbers by this time and this time and this time. It's more like mm -hmm. what we need to do sort of stuff. Um, you mentioned culture, which is incredibly important to us. Um, and, and anyone who else has visited our office can, can see that with our, our orange pipes and our frog running around <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, that is something that we, we're very, uh, paying very close attention to. I think that the good news is because our retention of our staff has been so high, um, you know, the first of the first 20 employees, probably most of them are still here. Um, wow. And that culture from when we were tiny is ingrained in everybody. Um, and so where you might worry that going from 100 to 500, we lose touch, I think that we have enough ambassadors for the company from the early days still here um, that, that that won't happen. That I think that, you know, sort of the higher logic way, as we call it, will infiltrate all new people. And we, and we hire for that, too, to be honest. We, we, we look for personality as much as we look for uh, skills and other things. You have to fit in. Uh, in order to, 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 to be successful here. So 
this is where as an interviewer it's really hard not to go down that rabbit hole because that is a fascinating thing you just said actually um about that yeah i i, I have to indulge it for just a second so can you give me just a little insight into what it takes to become a part of higher logic and then everybody else i promise we're going to uh, go into a little bit more about tech investments in the association industry i'm going to bring on another guest to join uh rob and myself but uh yes can you just please um because i would love to know what the story is with that with with our hiring practices yeah yeah, yeah. i mean so obviously we're growing right um in fact you know i'll give a little plug we have like 15 open positions right now uh, that's again less from the deal and more from just our our, our, state, our regular growth this year, which has been phenomenal. Um, and we are going to be growing quite a bit over the next few years. I mean, I don't I don't have real numbers projected out yet, but definitely quite a bit. So um, we're looking to expand the Orange Army. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, we have uh, you know we have a great office here in Arlington, um, but we are also looking to expand into a uh, second city. Um, so somewhere in the U.S. that has. Uh, great access to great resources of people um, that has, you know, an airport, obviously the kind of things you need in, in, a, in a fast growing company. Um, and so it's necessarily all Washington, but, but Washington is certainly our primary thing right now. That's, that's all I could really talk about in terms of where we'd be. Cause I, I have no idea. Not that it's secret. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah, so there's that. Um, and like I said, we, we obviously need certain skills. Um, you know, in software development, you have to have the right development skills and sales, you have to have the right sales skills and so forth. But, um, you know, uh, culture is very, very important and it's not, you know, uh, anything other than having just a great attitude, the can do attitude, being able to have fun and, and those sorts of things. Um, if you, you know, you, we occasionally have a bad hire and they, they kind of sit in their cube and don't talk to anybody. And then it's kind of clear. It's not, it's not a cultural fit. Not that they're necessarily not skilled. Um, but if there's not, if there's not that fit with the company, it's harder for them to do well. And so. We hope to fix them, but you know, it's not always the case. So yeah, absolutely. And and I just want to bring in some comments over here. There's, uh, you know, Maddie Grant joined us and said, "Yeah, culture is very important." Yep. And then, uh, hey, Maddie. And then uh, Marjorie says, "Need a college statistics major for a summer internship." <laughs> just happened to know one. <laughs> we do have a very strong intern uh, program. Yes, internship. So we yeah. uh, just on that note, uh, mostly college seniors. So if you're uh -huh. going to if they're going to be a senior uh, the following year, that's the kind of thing we look for. We and we do that because we want to hire them. Um, we want oh, Marjorie says he will be. All right. Uh, give them uh, uh, some good training and then potentially um, hire them the following year. All right. And we do actually do a lot of that. There's a lot of uh, uh, great talent um, from friends and family and in, in sort of the high school. I mean the, the college level that uh, that is a great feeding ground for us. Awesome. For well, we're, I'm going to let you type over to Marjorie or connect with <laughs> yeah, her and how to hear from. But um, I do want to take this opportunity to open up the conversation to everyone and to say that I'm going to invite our, our next guest. Our next guest is uh, recognized as one of five to watch by ASAU's Associations Now magazine and, and winner of the National Association of Realtors Technology Spotlight Award. Um, ben Martin is uh, Chief Engagement Officer at Online Community Results and just phenomenal guy, but has a lot of insight into watching what happens with technology investments um, in the association community. And so I wanted to invite him on so that he could talk a little bit uh, to this point and share a little bit about some of his insights and to answer some questions for us. I thought it would be a lot of fun for all of us and an education in all ways. So Ben, hi, yes. welcome. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me <laughs> I'm now? glad you're here. I can hear you good. and I can see you. So this oh. is all good. Um, is it just me or are we seeing a lot more investments in association technology companies recently? Well, so from what I've been able to discern, uh, talking with people who have been doing this for a lot longer than me, I mean, I've been in the industry for 20 years and it seems like there's a lot going on right now. Uh, and, but just to confirm this with folks who have been around for longer than me, um, I have chatted with some folks who have been doing this for, you know, going 30, 40 years. Uh, and what they've told me is that it kind of goes in ebbs and flows. And that right, right now, for some reason, uh, there's a lot of interest in the association market and there does seem to be a spike 
Um, I first got interested in this topic about a year ago, actually when uh, one of Rob's competitors uh, was fully acquired or wholly acquired by Personify. Um, and Personify is one of these private equity backed, we can talk about what all this, what private equ equity is versus venture capital versus self-funded, we can talk about that later. But um, you know, when they got bought up, um, for me, I had a couple of clients running their software and I was like, well, what does this mean for my clients that they're now gonna be wholly owned by an AMS company? Um, and so that just got my wheels turning. And um, you know, as I started to see more and more of these investments happen, so like, uh, just a few months ago, uh, IMUS, uh, which is one of the major AMSs, they took a big round of equity funding. Uh, Member Suite took one earlier this year. Um, and then there have been other um, kind of mergers and acquisitions within the space recently. So, I mean, yes, we're, we're seeing a lot more uh, investments right now. I think one of the big reasons, and <laughs> you'll chuckle at this, but there's actually an association for private equity uh, <laughs> uh, <course>. companies. <laughs> yes, of course, because there's an association for everything. And I've spoken with their executive director and he says, absolutely, there's a lot of activity in the market uh, because in his words, uh, there aren't a whole lot of great deals out there anymore. And so private equity firms are just like beating the bushes for where are the good deals to be had. And we could talk about their motivations and what, you know, what, their, what their intentions are with all of this stuff. But um, I mean, the bottom line is that yes, there's, there is more activity going on right now than there has been probably over the past 10 years. Um, and I think a lot of it started, like to, to Rob's point earlier, he mentioned Abila. Um, they took, uh, they, they did their merger back in 2011 or 2012 with Avectra. Um, and that, that kind of seemed to kick off um, a whole string of additional uh, private equity investments. Uh, but yes, yeah, so bottom line is, yeah, I think there's a lot more going on in the space than there has been historically. Yeah. And I mean, I know that I know that uh, with all of us kind of working in different areas and just a little background about your connection. So through the work that you do through working with, you know, uh, online communities and 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 uh, working with the different uh, I hate to say I hate the word vendors. So like working with, um, you know, association partners in that way, um, we've certainly seen, you know, things go in different directions, you know, and I I want to, you know, I want to talk a little bit about how this round of funding for Higher Logic compares to others in the association sector that you've seen, because it's it's a little different, right? Yeah. Well, and Rob, Rob can confirm this, but to the best of my knowledge, this is the largest private equity funding uh, that's ever been made in the association market. Um, I mean, just to give you some context, um, Higher Logic took fifty-five million. Um, Imus, which I think everybody knows is like the the longest running. I mean, uh, Rob used to work Man at Imus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're the yeah. grandfather of AMSs. They've been around for like 25, 30 years. So their round of funding this year was twenty six million dollars. Now, wow, I did not of, realize that. But let's just make sure that we're talking about apples to apples here, because as I mentioned at the top, you know, every deal is different. Um, yeah, and so if you know, Higher Logic takes fifty five million, Imus takes twenty six million. When you talk, when you're talking about equity, typically you're talking about um, the company is taking an ownership stake at some level in the company. So, you know, Rob mentioned that his investment was a minority investment, which means mm -hmm. that uh, JMI does not own a majority of the shares in the company. The owners and the the uh, the, you know, the the founders of the company still own majority stake, which means they still have control, as as Rob was saying. Um, but the folks who do take equity means that basically they own a few shares in the company and they have some influence over how the company operates going forward. Um, so it, you know, we, we don't know because nobody will ever disclose the terms of the, of the acquisition. So, or the, the, uh, the investment. Yeah, so uh, you, know, Rob, you don't disagree with that. Right? You're not going to disclose. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, I mean, yeah, so I miss in the case of I miss like that could have been a 10% stake in the company, whereas higher logics could have been 5%. And so the numbers just have to be run differently. And, and again, the, the financial terms are almost never disclosed. Um, but you can, you can sometimes get a sense for where they are, but um, I don't know, that's, that, that's where I'm headed. But to answer your question directly, to the best of my knowledge, this is the largest single investment in any association technology company in the history of the universe. <laughs> I do in believe the history that. of the association universe, yes. Okay. So um, I want to do, I just want to do sort of a quick temperature check with our live audience and make sure that um, 
you know, you guys, whenever you have questions or if there's ever a point that you want more information about, you can type in over to the side. But are we all good over here? Everybody having a good time? All right. <laughs> good stuff. And, you know, if you want us to go in a different direction or if I'm not asking the questions you want, you always have the ability to say more of this, please, less of that, please. So what I wanted to go to next is I wanted to talk a little bit about what that looks like. So, um, you know, I, clearly you have to show growth over a period of time, right? And you have to, because the investors, I mean, they they expect to have you know, a certain amount. What does that look like? I mean, when, how does this work? Cause I don't under, I don't know this. So, you know, when are investors usually paid back and what kind of return are they usually looking for? Just, yeah. and either one of you can like explain to me how this works. Rob, you want to, you want to take it or you want me to give you Go what ahead. I mean? You sure. can do the, yeah, the generic. Or the, yeah. You know, the yeah. General. So I, again, I'm going to approach this from kind of the general, um, state of affairs in yeah. private equity, but it, um, it, it could be different for this deal. Every uh, private equity firm is going to operate a little bit differently, but I've been trying to just spread the, the net as far as I can and, and try to come up with some general guidance on what happens with this stuff. So here's what I know. And again, this goes from talking with private equity investors, people who actually work for the firms themselves, folks who have been acquired or have taken equity funding, such as Rob, um, and even talking with this uh, private equity and venture capital association executive. Um, so here's, here's what I've, I've discovered. Um, when these equity deals get done, um, the investors are of course looking for a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. And the investment, the return that typically folks are looking for is somewhere between four and six times what they've put in. So I put in $10,000, I'm hoping to get 40 to 60 back. Um, also, these private equity funds have some kind of like a contractually obligated window that basically says, hey, look, within a period of X years, everybody who puts into this fund needs to be paid back. Um, to the best of my knowledge, those um, windows range somewhere between five and 10 years. But on average, what I'm hearing is that between four and six years, the, uh, the, the investors are hoped to be paid back on their investment. So basically, let's just say I put in $10,000. I should expect that within four to six years, I should get somewhere between four to six times my money back um, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Let me also just talk a little bit about who are these investors. Um, when I first started researching this, I had visions that there were like these fat cats in New York City with their three-piece suits um, who, you know, they were just basically li living off of dad daddy's trust funds and trying to find <laughs> a good way to get uh, some money back from what they've inherited. Uh, but what I've come to learn is that the investors are actually um, a lot like um, like we are the beneficiaries, or at least in many cases, our parents are. So for example, um, if, you're, if you're drawing a government pension, a big investor in private equity um, are, are pension funds um, and also uh -huh. uh, university trusts. Um, these are organizations that are looking for a return on their investment above and beyond what they can get in the stock market because the stock market hasn't been as lucrative as it was previously, but you know, if our parents are hoping to bring home a pension or if our university trusts are trying to grow their, uh, their, uh, their balance sheet, uh, private equity is a great way to do that. And by the way, in, even just to get into private equity, if you actually wanted to invest in it, um, oftentimes you have to have a net worth of over a million dollars and have at least a hundred thousand dollars to play with. So, um, you know, just, just to kind of give you a, a sense for who's, who's playing in this and what the expectations are. Oh, that's my wow. iPhone. Right <laughs> <laughs> my iPhone is blowing up. Oh, uh, no. I think tweeting at People are, you're so, I know they're tweeting. They're so, they're so, in, you know, just in love with what you're saying. Yeah. So just to give you a sense of like, like who's, who's playing this game and you know, where the money's coming from and what they're expecting in, on, on their return. And, you know, Rob's been around this longer than I have. And like, he's, he's seen hundreds of these deals. I don't know if you, if you have anything to reflect on this or maybe uh, uh, take it to another yeah. level. Maybe just to clarify a little bit. So yes, I mean, what, what, what I typically see is the 10 year fund. Um, when the, uh, the, the private equity or whoever it is and does the investment, it's somewhere in that 10 years, right? It could be the first year, it could be the ninth year, probably not much later than that. And then they tend, as they sell companies within the fund, they tend to pay the actual investors back, right? So it's not like they have to wait 10 years necessarily. If you were to buy a company X on year one and sell it in year five, 
that portion that was invested in year one could be paid back with the proceeds in year five to the to the investors to be reinvested maybe or whatever. So um, yeah, everything Ben says is correct. Just clarifying a little bit. Um, you know, in our case, JMI is on. I think this is their ninth fund. So they start a fund, they raise however many millions of dollars, um, and then they close they close that bit of it, and then throughout that process, they're doing their investment investments, and then maybe a few years into it when they've sort of invested all their money, they open another fund, right? So it's a serial thing. Um, I think this one we're in is like JMI nine, if I recall correctly, and it's a billion dollars. So, you know, and we're one of the first ones. It was, it just opened, I think it was last year. I don't remember exact details, but it's, but it's pretty recent. Um, and so that means, let's say that we're in the first year, that means that they don't really have to, have to start thinking about doing something with higher logic for nine years. Um, but Ben's right. Four to six is is normally the target, and and then as to what doing something is, it means either um, re-upping, right? It means uh, often selling their share to another private equity company. Interestingly, it's a sort of a you know a feeding thing where there's small ones at the beginning and there's massive ones. You might have seen uh, when Vista bought Cvent for 1.3 billion, I think it was some ridiculous amount of money. Um, Steven had already had investors, went public, paid back those investors, and then uh, Vista came in and gave them all this cash uh, to take them out. So, you know, that kind of thing happens. Um, and then, of course, it's strategic, right? So it may be, and, and that's sort of the best case, that uh, a company like Higher Logic at some point becomes part of a bigger company that is in a space that makes a lot of sense to them. Um, you know, in, in the normal corporate space, it's almost always Oracle. Or, or one of these companies, but um, in our space, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot, because there's a lot of activity, it might make sense even to say, okay, in five years, Higher Logic is going to buy, and, you know, just pick any, any, uh, any vendor you can think of, and so we're going to recapitalize by getting a new investor, we'll buy out our current investors, and give us the money to buy that other company and make us a bigger company. So there's a lot of different potential outcomes. Um, certainly, there's nothing in the short term ever. Uh, they do not want to turn their m- money around very quickly because it's so hard to put it to work. Um, if you have a good company and you've got it working, you know you don't want to sell even for a great profit, even for you know eighty, a hundred percent return in a year. Sounds great on paper, but then you've got to reinvest that money, and can you put that back to work in a place that's going to get you the kind of returns that company could? So um, it's interesting, you know, stuff that may be somewhat counterintuitive if you think about it, but when they explain why they do it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I I would say one practical takeaway here for folks that are are watching this is um, I think higher logic has taken money here under the best possible circumstances. Um, It's a minority investment, which means that Rob and his co-founders are still in charge of the company and they still call the shots. And, you know, certainly um, the investors have some say in, in what they're doing. So for example, Rob said at the top, Hey, we're looking for advice on how to grow. And obviously that advice yeah. comes with a certain uh, understanding that you're going to accept the advice that we provide. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but, but the best news here is that um, Higher Logic is going to stay, you know, with the founder's control and that it's not a, it's not a takeover. So, you know, Rob can speak to this as well. He's seen several mergers and acquisitions within the association space over the last couple of years, which I'm sure informs his decision making on which uh, equity firm to go with. Um, but in some cases, uh, these private equity firms have eviscerated the entire staff of these companies. And now these customers don't even recognize who's, you know, who's picking up the phone. They don't recognize the people at the trade show anymore. Um, and so that is a, that's an approach that some of these private equity firms have taken. And, you know, for them, perhaps it has worked historically for them. But I think one of the challenges in our little association ecosystem is that we're so relationship focused. And, you know, when, when there's a, an overhaul of the staff and you don't recognize these people that you've worked with for the past five years anymore, um, that really affects the business relationship. And I think uh, at least initially, that's a really high hurdle to get over and to, to cope with. Nobody likes change. Yeah. Um, and so I think in this case, higher logic has taken money that is going to minimize any disruptive change initially. Um, but, you know, do realize that, you know, to, to Rob's point, eventually higher logic has got to recapitalize um, and the investors have to be paid back. So at some point there's going to be another transaction and, you know, hopefully with Rob's guidance, 
um, it'll continue to be the, the less disruptive type of, uh, of investment. Well, and this is, we're talking about, as you were saying, this is um, a really great situation. I mean, this is kind of the best case scenario, but certainly there are other times when, um, you know, there are potentially these, these pitfalls and problems that might impact people who um, are impacted by, by their partners in technology who don't have as auspicious a beginning or as a, a as you know high quality of, of an exchange so um, what happens then I mean what are what are some what are some things that association executives really need to know about different types of investments because they don't all go this way and sure. so what are some of the things that they need to look for well, so uh, just to be clear, uh, you know, there are different different ways that companies are funded, obviously. You know, you've got self-funded companies like Rob's uh, early days in HireLogic when, you know, he basically bootstrapped the company with capital that he had working. You know, his, he raided his bank accounts and probably took out a home <laughs> equity loan and did stuff like that to build up the company. Um, so that's a privately funded or a, like a family held business is what you might call it. Um, then you've got um, a funding mechanism called venture capital. Uh, we hear a lot about VCs because VCs have done a ton of investment in very high profile companies like Facebook and LinkedIn and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's pretty uncommon uh, in the association space, actually, because, well, we could get a lot of reasons. But frankly, uh, associations aren't really a high growth um, opportunity uh, in general. I mean, we all know how much we pinch our own pennies <laughs> being managers, directors and VPs of, of program areas like we just we don't have a lot of money to spend on unlike uh you know big fortune 500 companies for example so you got vcs but they're not very common in, in uh, the association space there's actually two types of vcs uh, just so you're aware there's crowdfunded vcs which like you know kiki you and me could get together and, and pony up a couple of hundred bucks between us and we can get into what's called a crowdfunded vc and this is now like uh there's there's like an official mechanism with the security and exchange commission on crowdfunding venture capital. I may have to um, say so, that 200 bucks may be my price point. I'm just saying right. that, that might be where I can go. <laughs> I feel you. It's Christmas time, you know, yeah. those kids are <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you've got private equity uh, and they're there. Frankly, there are different types of private equity as well. So there are private equity firms that prefer to do full buyouts and, and mergers and acquisitions and takeovers. And then there are others that are growth equity, which is really what um, HireLogic has gotten into, is they've got a growth equity um, investment that allows them to take that. So just realize that there are, we've got all these different funding opportunities. There are even companies out there that will buy a company and kind of take it over, but hold it for the long term. So it's like a buy and hold kind of situation, as opposed to what you might think of in private equity. And this is kind of a pejorative term, so don't take it quite like this, but it's kind of like house flipping. You know, you buy the house and then you make some improvements and then over a period of time, uh, you've, you know, made back 20%. Um, so, uh, but uh, obviously private equity is holding for a much longer uh, period of time. So, you know, for me, the thing to just realize is that change is inevitable. You know, even if you're a privately held company, um, you're, you're working with a privately held AMS or a privately held community platform, at some point, those guys are gonna wanna retire or they're going to be presented with an opportunity. Um, so change is inevitable. It's like the, we can't count on our technology to stay in the same hands for forever. So we've got to, we have to realize that change is coming. We just need to be prepared for it. Um, uh, you know, one th as this hobby that I'm working on, kind of tracking this stuff, uh, I've actually written a, an article for associations now that's going to come out on December 20th. Um, and I've also gone through this, you know, the kind of crazy stupid thing that I did to actually create a website, which, which is like a news service around um, investments that are being made in the association market. Um, so it's called the nerd. <laughs> Can you spell that out though? It's not nerd and E R D, right? No, it's, it's the nerd.org, but nerd is spelled with an I. So it, oh. it stands for the nonprofit investments resource department. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, but basically it's, it's, I'm, it's really more a resource for myself to be able to like, all right, let me remember who took what money when, and I can go in and I can search my archives and figure out, you know, when was it that I mistook that money or when did Fontiva get their round of, of uh, VC money? 
I can go back to it and look at it. And, you know, from time to time, I'm even posting in rumors. Like, so for example, Rob, you probably remember this. <laughs> we were talking at the ASAE annual convention back in August. And I said, hey, uh, word on the street is there's an association engagement platform on the market. You have any idea who that might be? <laughs> <laughs> and Rob was very uh, diplomatic. <laughs> oh, I don't think I lied to you. Gosh. <laughs> you guys, that is hilarious. We were in the middle of it at the time, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so uh, I'm very bad at reading body language, so if Matt <laughs> actually gave it away, I had no idea. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, lo and behold, a month later, there's the news, and I'm like, oh, how about that? So um, anyway, it's the nerd.org, and it's just a very geeky, stupid thing that I'm doing to kind of help myself at least keep my arms around everything that's happening, and if people are interested in, you know, subscribing to that. I, I can't expect that you're going to get more than like a, an update or two a month. But um, anyway, it's it's out there if you want to take a look. I think that's really interesting, though. And don't believe Ben, actually, because I don't know of anything that he hasn't actually started and then has become, you know, some kind of a valuable resource for people down the road. So, I mean, everything from like his CAE blog and all of that stuff. So I'm, I know I'm going back to the crypt here, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but uh, I have a couple questions over here that I wanted to make sure that we, we talked about first Meredith wanted to make sure she got called away for a second. She wanted to make sure that we had talked about angel investors wow. um, and talking a little bit about uh, do association services firms tend to get uh, access to those kinds of investors. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is, and this is a really important point, Marjorie brings up, so companies like yours will have added capabilities from these investments. I would assume this could have an effect on an association's strategic planning. Could you speak to that? I think that's really key here because you know the things that you're working on that could impact, I'm sure, some of your your you know, um, some of your customers and especially some of the ones that um, that you've been with for a long time and you would know what it is that they're, you know, could help them to grow. So first, let me give uh, Ben a chance to, to speak. Uh, and of course, Rob always <laughs> to speak to Meredith's question. Um, and then let's let's talk about Marjorie's. OK. Well, I think, Rob, let me defer to you on the angel investment stuff, because that's not really something that I've been exposed to much. And as somebody who's started up multiple companies, I, I would imagine you've had your share of angel investors. Yeah, so angels, I mean, there's there's sort of two major types that, that I see, one being the friends and family, right? So you have a rich uncle, wants to help you out, you have a trust, whatever it is. I mean, there's, so there's a lot of that sort of thing going on. Ben mentioned the crowdsourcing thing, which is a relatively recent uh, legal development. I think, um, you know, Steve Case from uh, AOL was real big into, into making that happen. Um, it was mostly a, a thing that happened with the government to come up with the laws that would support that. Um, so we're not talking about like the, the just even the little stuff that you'd see on Indiegogo or, or those sorts of things, but like that for investing in stock uh, came out maybe three, four years ago. There was a big law. Very recent, um, yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but then there's also professional angels. And so there's angel networks. Um, you know, our CTO Connor is involved uh, in one here called Next Gen Angels, um, which I think is, and it's not really a franchise, but they have, they have offices all over. And it's just a bunch of folks who have money to invest, who want to get into private equity without, you know, to Ben's point, the big money you need. I think um, even a million dollars would be a small number to get into real private equity. It's, it's, it's largely institutional. Um, which is, you know, the, the, the big funds uh, that, that he was talking about. Um, it, but you can get in. Yes, you're right. You can get in with $100,000. I think I wouldn't risk 10% of my, uh, my net worth on something like private equity when you've got, you know, other, other things like insurance and stuff to use for that. But mm -hmm. getting a little off topic here. But angels is a great way to do it. And, and so, you know, people like Connor, uh, you know, he invests some of his money. He also is a technical advisor. He goes and he helps you know, the companies that want to be invested and in work on their pitch um, and then helps the investors evaluate, you know, from, from various standpoints, technical or financial, uh, whether the deal makes sense. Um, you know, I'm involved in a, in a CEO group in Washington called um, Mindshare, which is about 900 CEOs, mostly tech CEOs in DC. And, you know, we have a thing about every month where three companies that are looking for investment come in and pitch to a bunch of Mindshare CEOs and we give feedback on 
the pitch or do we think it's a good investment or should we invest or connect them with people who have money to invest? And there's certainly a lot of money in Washington to be invested. So um, there's a, you know, Angel kind of almost uh, summarizes anything that's not one of these big institutional kind of deals. And that reminds me of Lyra. Lyra just uh, commented here, what kind of investment would Kickstarter be considered? So would that fall into like crowdsourcing or? Yeah, that, that's that's crowdsourcing. And Kickstarter, I think, may even they may even be doing that stock one now. But there, but there's a difference between the Kickstarter kind of thing where we're going to sort of pre-buy a product mm-hmm. uh, or maybe donate versus actually getting stock in a company. And that latter was the one. Ben, did you say you knew the name of that law? I don't remember what it was called. Um, the law that let them do that. Ben frozen or is he oh, very I think still? he's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing that mannequin thing that everybody has been doing where you just stop. Ah, that's anyway, what it is. yeah. <laughs> um, not sure what's going on. Here he goes. Oh, okay, oh, he's going to well. reconnect. Uh, yeah, AI. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Ben is AI. That All these years, I never knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you hear Rob's question, though? Do you remember uh, the name of the law? Oh, the, the name of the law? No, I don't. To Rob's point, yeah, it's a rel- relatively recent development. Basically what it does is it gives uh, investors a little bit more uh, insurance or confidence in the investments that they're making. Like with Kickstarter, you basically say, hey, I'm going to contribute $20 and I'm going to expect to get this thing back in return at some point. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a less serious version of investing. It's like, hey, I, I like that thing. And if I give you some money, I want an early version of it. Um, you know, with with what the SEC has put forward uh, with the crowdsourced venture capital, it's basically giving some better guarantees and it's basically holding the people who take your money more accountable for the money that you give them. Gotcha. Well, we'll expect to see it on the nerd. You yeah. know. <laughs> we'll look at the nerd.org later <laughs> to find out what, you know, more about law. Um, so I wanted to go to the question Marjorie had about, uh, you know, giving sort of a heads up or sort of guiding your customers as far as their, like an association strategic planning and how sure. it might be impacted by some of, of the develop, developments that are taking place. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's more or less what I said earlier. I, you know, I, I obviously can't talk about specifics, not just because in a lot of cases you can't legally, right. but also just because deals aren't done until they're done, right? So, right, right. Um, you know, we, we do plan to do some acquisitions over the next few years that are additive to what we offer um, that, that fall into that category I mentioned earlier where they're, you know, engagement related. They are going to, you know, improve either the information associations get or the interactions that, that, that they have with their members or the members have with each other, et cetera. So, you know, I can tell you directionally that's where we would go. We would not, for example, acquire an MS. It's, yeah. that's not, that's kind of the back office side of, of, of the business. And, not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's just not where we're focused. Um, but something where, like I said, the the members would interact, um, that's a that's a good thing. So you can probably make some assumptions. We had a list of about 10 that we came up with maybe a year ago that were not necessarily companies, but, but sort of products. It might make sense for us. Um, and over time, you know, I don't know that we'll, we certainly won't do 10, but, but we'll, we'll pick the ones that we think make the most sense. It would help our customers. And, you know, part of the, part of the reason for this, just talking financially, we have 750 clients, right? If I can buy a, you know, piece of software that I, that doesn't share too many of those and I could put it into my system in a way that makes sense, right? That the data is all in there and that um, I've got single sign on and, and, and all that sort of stuff. If we can make it valuable to them and I can sell it to some portion of those 750 clients, that's a, that's a win, right? So I take a, a you know company that maybe has a hundred clients, sell it to my seven hundred and fifty, even if it's only half of them buy it. That makes a lot of sense financially, but also more importantly, um, we do want to give them you know as much as we can to help them them do their jobs. And so, you know, directionally, I can tell you that I can't give you specifics on which ones are you know in in negotiations at the moment or or soon to be. Okay. Um, so that's so good. That's I good. think that, I think that uh, ooh, I got a little ooh. echo. All right. I'm going to, I think it's, yeah. Okay. So what I want to go with next is an Adrian commented over to the side that she thinks her question is kind of the same as Marjorie's. I don't think so. So I'm going to offer it to 
uh, Ben and Rob, do either of you feel that this will be a negative or positive for small staff, small staff, small budget associations who would like to work with companies like yours but have to pick and choose their next technology advancement? So I'm going to put that on up there. I think that's a different question. Yeah, definitely a different question. Um, yeah, definitely a different question. Um, well, I'll, I'll t I can take it first, Rob, and I'll, and I'll be brief because I think you're going to have, I, I don't, I don't want to, well, I think you're going to have different things to say uh, about this. But what I would say is that, you know, as private equity firms are looking into and want to be affiliated with companies that are more profitable, um, because obviously the more profits they bring in, the more they can pay back on their investments. Um, unfortunately, for smaller staffs, they have smaller budgets, right? And so um, those clients may be deemed to be less profitable than others. Um, and so I think that um, on average, anyway, I would say uh, that smaller associations may not benefit as much from these kinds of investments long term um, than, than, other, than larger ones. Um, in the short term, maybe you'll get access to better technology for a few years until the company starts feeling pressure to raise their price point in order to better pay back their investors. So um, that's that's my take on it, Rob. I don't I don't know if you've got uh, a similar thought or maybe totally. Yeah, different. I, I'll I'll go with a completely opposite answer. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Not, not to be disagreeable, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, to the first point, profitability uh, is not necessarily that important, actually. Um, growth is is the other sort of lever. And so if we look at our business, um, there's probably 10 what we call levers, KPIs, factors, whatever you want to call them, that sort of speak to the value of the company. And um, profitability is one of those, but some of them are opposing, right? So, so you know, when we do our five-year plan, we say we could either have X amount of growth and maybe let's say no profit or very little profit, or we can have you know a much smaller amount of growth and higher profit. And either case, the company has the same value within you know some balance, right? So um, you know the, the the one we've always chosen and and likely will still choose for the next five years uh, is the growth one. Like we we are not focused on profit. Now we don't want to lose money, obviously, and we and we we haven't for a long time. Um, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean. First of all, that we don't we don't focus on it. Number one, and number two, uh, you know, a, a, a particular client being profitable uh, is also not something we really look at that much. Um, we look at it as a whole. So we want numbers like how much does it cost us to uh, obtain a client and to keep a client happy and those sorts of things. Those are all good good metrics. But really, the profit in our case it gets reinvested back in growth. So, uh, point number one, clarification. Number two, um, and I announced this at our at our uh, event. You know, we're building, for example, a data warehouse, and we're going to probably spend, I don't know, close to a million dollars on making a pretty kick-ass data warehouse for uh, engagement numbers and for other stuff. And, you know, our initial project is to do it for ourselves so that we can look at how people are using our software and improve the software uh, based on usage. And that's, we're going to do that, obviously. That's very important. Um, and, and so everybody benefits from that. But secondly, you know, there's a lot of, talk in the association world about about data warehousing, about using Tableau and Power BI and those kinds of tools to get insights and so forth. And the projects I've seen happen are very expensive, right? They're with very big comp very big organizations, um, and they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, and most small orgs can't afford to do that. So the advantage they'll get is that we'll spend all that money and we'll sell it 750 times, right? So mm -hmm. I don't have to sell it for $200,000 when I paid a million for it, if I'm going to sell it 700 times. And so I would actually say, you know, this is where I, I think we differ, is that um, us having more money to do things like this will allow us to create better products and sell them for less to more people. Um, and so with our goal being getting more clients buying our software as opposed to making profit, I think that works out for everybody. So right. what level of discount are you going to start offering across the board, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on this call, if you buy today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just want to make sure I give you guys both a chance. And I know we're at the top of the hour, but but uh, Meredith had a great point. Uh, Adrienne agrees that she would love, you know, she's taking the same sort of thing here. 
what I'm hearing here though from both of you is that the client sweet spot is really not small associations because regardless of your profit decisions, their contribution to gross margin isn't impressive. Is that about right? Because even if all you look at is acquisition cost, they're high relative to lifetime revenue. Um, nothing in there is wrong. Uh, I don't think we look at it that way. I mean, but, but, but to your point, Meredith, we, we don't go after very small associations of clients. Um, you know, we, and I'm not saying we won't sell to them, obviously, if they, if they want to buy our software, but we do tend to focus on associations that have an annual budget of a million or above. Now that's not huge no. by any means, right? Those are still pretty small associations. So we have uh, specifically uh, an offering for what we call small orgs, the small org association offering. And it's for associations with any budget below two and a half million, above two and a half million, then, you know, it's more of our enterprise product. But, um, but so we, so we sort of gear ourselves toward that. We, we create the product in a way that allows that to be profitable. And so the other thing we like about having um, lots and lots of small uh, customers as opposed to a few big ones is that it provides a lot of st stability in our income, right? If, if I have, and, and, you know, through the JMI process, that's one of the first things they ask. Well, like, how many clients uh, make up the top 30% of your revenue? Mm -hmm. In our case, we said, well, it's, I don't remember the number, but let's say it's 100. And then they're, oh, that's good. What they don't want to see is you depend on three clients for 30% of your revenue, because then if one of those clients goes away, you're in a lot of trouble. So in general, we like having lots of clients, um, and size does not matter all that much uh, in those terms. The only reason we don't, go below a million and again as i said we'd still sell the, to organizations under a million we just don't go after them is the, the numbers of those clients are really really big and you have to have different ways of talking to them and we have a pretty high touch approach um so we can't hire enough bodies enough people to reach out to the you know the eighty thousand associations that are under a million in budget but we can to the seven or eight thousand that are above a million budget. And that's, and that's just, that's just our business plan that, you know, and for better or worse, I mean, you look at some of these other groups, like, you know, your membership and member clicks, you know, they do very well selling to very small associations because that's, that's kind of how they're set up. So there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's, it's just, just a uh, model. yeah, just, just, just our high touch um, doesn't allow for it uh, to, to go too, too far down. Well, okay. So I think that we could honestly keep going for a long, time on this, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And I don't know, guys, uh, those of you who are actually watching live, what do you think? I mean, are, did you learn something new? Did you learn something that was helpful here? You know, write in the, in the chat box what you think about it. I personally really got a lot out of this. And I want to thank everyone for joining us for this week's association chat. I want to take some time to thank our guests, Rob and Ben, uh, for providing us with their time and expertise. And before we go, I want to make sure that you know uh, some things that are coming up for association chat. Our next chat is going to be discussing leadership from an association pro. We're talking with JP Murray next Tuesday. And it's really in, we're going to start looking at ways that we can uh, build, do some professional development and uh, build our leadership skills going into 2017. And he's the guy to do it. Really, really great, interesting person that um, has a lot to share. So I hope you'll tune in then. I hope that you had fun with us and that you've learned something that will help you and your association now or in the future. And if you like association chat, in fact, if you love us, please consider sharing this chat with your colleagues and give us some love on social media. And as always, if you want to continue the discussion, you can join the association chat Facebook group for regular updates on upcoming topics and special guests. Have a fun and safe Thanksgiving. Enjoy time with your families and join it join us back here at the same day same time next week thank you very much thanks kiki all right thanks everyone